it looks like you're ready to begin module three, the module on prenatal development. This happens to be Our my next favorite module, uh, module in module title three, book, so hopefully you'll come to enjoy it. Which as much we can define as a time period from conception so let's begin. until birth. Now, perhaps interestingly, the previous edition of the text included the birthing process. The current text which we're using has separated that out and has a sole chapter, standalone chapter on birth and the postpartum time. So definitely an expansion of some area, which I think you hopefully will find interesting. It's very likely that you have some associations with Charles Darwin, perhaps a famous theory, perhaps a famous book. Take a moment, can you think of either the name of the theory or the book or the mechanism of the theory? Well, uh, Charles Darwin's book was The Origin of Species, revolutionary, uh, still impactful. The theory was his theory of evolution. Many students are confused. They believe that it's questionable, it's still a theory, whether or not evolution exists. Scientists consider it to be a given. The theory is the mechanism by which evolution operates. Indeed, you won't have a medicine that you'll take, a surgical procedure that you hopefully won't undergo that wasn't first done on animals or done with animals. This would necessitate a continuity between the different life forms and their origins, at least in the very early stages. Now, in terms of uh, Darwin, you might think the picture below looks like Darwin a little bit, just the age and the hair primarily, and the beard length. That individual is Wallace, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, if you want the full name. His theory of evolution and even the mechanism of natural selection by which he thought it occurred, and Darwin also agreed, his ideas actually predated Darwin. Uh, indeed, the gentleman wrote an early paper together, but history has largely forgotten Wallace. In part, uh, Wallace was deferential to Darwin. Uh, in part, uh, Darwin was getting filleted by popular media of the time in terms of cartoons showing people descending from apes and being ape-like and so on. So consider them both co-authors of the theory of evolution and natural selection. So even if history doesn't give uh, Wallace his full due, hopefully we can. Sometimes you'll hear the phrase survival of the fittest as the uh, underlying mechanism of evolution. This really isn't so. Survival alone, not that important. It's survival and reproduction. If the, you can be the most fit uh, animal possible, but if you leave no descendants, unless you're helping your very genetically closely related relatives survive, kind of meaningless in terms of evolution. Now, you see the heading of the slide, uh, Charles Darwin in evolutionary psychology, and you might think, oh, Darwin was a psychologist. No. But his ideas have laid the foundation for evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology is not only interested in the physical structures that have evolved over time, but more so behaviors, behaviors that are helpful into survival and reproduction and make for a more fit human being in terms of survival. So consider him to be a major, the major contributor of evolutionary psychology, maybe an honorary evolutionary psychologist, but certainly not a uh, quote unquote true psychologist. Let's consider a modern day evolutionary psychologist that of Dr. David Buss, who's probably considered the number one guy in the area, or woman, anyway, person of that area. Please visit the uh, TED Talk for the link, and you'll find the outcome of a particular experiment, which you will need to know to answer your uh, text question quiz on this chapter for this module. Imagine that you're in public, 
and an attractive person of the opposite sex walks up to you and said, I've seen you around and I find you really attractive. And they ask three questions. Would you go on a date with me? Would you come to my apartment with me? And would you have sex with me? As you might want to suspect, very different outcomes if the subject was male versus female. Let's consider for women first. If the woman was attract approached by an attractive man, and I'm going to do some rounding here, roughly half agreed to go on a date with him, a very small number, around 5%, agreed to go to his apartment, and the number who agreed to have sex with him, none, not a sip. Now let's consider a man approached by an attractive woman with that same scenario. Roughly the same number agreed to go on a date, roughly 50%. The number who agreed to go back to the apartment with him, a little bit higher than the women. The women we rounded to five. For men, 70%. So five versus 70. And the number that agreed to have sex, well, for the women it was zero. For men it was 75%. And many of those who didn't agree apologized, saying, oh, I've got a girlfriend, I've got a wife, da 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 da. So very big sex difference in this sort of behavior. Now, in terms of possible explanations, but uh, investment in offspring. When a woman is pregnant, she's going to invest nine months of her uh, life in the state of pregnancy. Uh, the she'll probably be the primary caretaker in most cultures. It's a biologically expensive endeavor, also risk of death. For a male, the sex act can be limited to less than 30 seconds in some circumstances. So potentially very little investment. So he can flutter from flower to flower with really no ill effects versus if a woman's unchoosy, she might end up raising the child all by herself. And in terms of historical situations, uh, people didn't live alone. They, they needed to live in a community to survive. So men have been shaped evolutionary to be a little bit foot -foot foot loose and fancy free, whereas women have been selected by evolution to be very, very picky shoppers. So let's see how you did. Megan's red hair and freckles, clearly observable and measurable, phenotype. Polio's genes for diabetes. Now you might say phenotype because you can measure and assess diabetes but the question specifically is asking about Julio's genetics, his genes, so it's genotype. Same for Olivia, although we can definitely measure petiteness, the question focused on her genetics, so that would be genotype. And the next one, your particular eye color. Well, clearly we're looking at something that's observable, so that would be phenotype. And if you're interested in eye color, we now believe that it's controlled by six, now due to the Human Genome Project, we uh, know it's due to 16 uh, genes and the majority of the input comes from one particular chromosome, that of chromosome number 15. I wanted to mention a little bit more about the Human Genome Project. We know that it began in 1990, completed in 2003. In terms of its importance, it's comparable to the splitting of the atom or the first man on moon. It was that big. And basically what it did is it sequenced the order of our bases. You might remember way back from biology, or maybe you're currently in it. The order of the adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine bases. So really quite a huge undertaking and a hugely important deal. Let's continue our exploration of basic terminology. I'm sure you're familiar with quite a few of these, but perhaps we're adding on a little bit of new information or just refreshing you. Either way is good. Let's start with chromosomes. These are the basic structures that house, that hold our genetic information. Different species have different numbers. How many would be in a human body? In other words, a human somatic cells. This would contrast to the sex cells, the uh, gametes. So think of the number that would be in a human body cell. 
maybe a cell in your nose or a cell in your toes. It would be easy to say 46 or 23 pair. How about for the sex cells, the uh, gametes? And what are they? What's the male gamete? What's the female gamete? Well, as you're probably tempted to say, the egg for a female, the sperm for a male. How many chromosomes per a typical sex cell? That would be half the number of a body cell, so 23 total. Let's now consider DNA. Do you know what DNA stands for? Hopefully you're thinking deoxyribonucleic acid. And what is it? It's a self-copying, it's a self-replicating molecule which makes up our genetic information. What does it look like? Maybe you're thinking double helix, well that's our fancy term, indeed you're right, but what does a double helix look like? Well, a twisted ladder. Now, the discovery of its shape, its form, do you know the gentleman associated with that? Perhaps you're thinking, oh, I can't remember their name, I'll give you a hint, W and C. Ah, Watson and Crick. Did you know, though, that they came to this discovery by looking at a picture from a fellow scientist who had freely shared the picture? And yet she was given no credit. Who was this famous scientist that you probably never heard of, who you should hear about? Rosalind Franklin. And her photo is known as Photo 51. And you're saying, hmm, 51, that rings a bell. Well, there was also an area of 51 uh, where UFOs were supposedly stored, but this is a different 51. But anyway, so let's remember Rosalind Franklin's name and the famous or infamous photo number 51. Let's continue with our basic terminology. Now, you might remember from intro psych that the neuron is considered to be the most fundamental unit of the nervous system. Now in the area we're talking about right now, the gene is the most basic unit of heredity. You probably know that genes come in forms of dominant and recessives. Dominants are expressed if the person inherits at least one dominant gene. Well, recessives are only expressed if no dominants are inherited to mask them. You should also know that most genetic conditions are due to harmful recessive genes. Now, many genes come in alternate forms. The term would be allele. So if you consider these 16 different genes that control eye color, some people inherit alleles for brown eyes, hazel eye, blue eyes, etc. So alleles are alternate forms of genes. Not every gene has an allele, but a huge number obviously do. Let's consider an applied question. If you have a neighbor, turn to your neighbor. If you have a housemate, maybe ask your housemate or a family member. If not, that's fine too. Let's say a boy inherits a harmful gene uh, on his X chromosome, the, specifically the X on the 23rd pair, for colorblindness. What happens? Will he be colorblind? Then consider the same question, but for a girl, or if you know the terminology, a cis girl. So on the 23rd pair, males have an XY, only one X in other words. So if he inherits a recessive gene, in this case a harmful one for colorblindness on his X, there's no dominant healthy gene to override it, so he will be colorblind. But for the girl, she has two X chromosomes, and we're saying that she's inherited one for colorblindness. 
we'll assume that if her parents aren't related closely, if they didn't meet at a convention for color blind people, chances are extremely high that she inherited a normal dominant um, typical gene for color blind, uh, I'm sorry, color ability to be seen. So she'll have normal color vision, but she's a carrier. So if she has a son, he is very likely, actually, he will be colorblind, but for the daughter, again, unlikely. But she could easily be a carrier if the girl inherits the X that has the deleterious harmful gene. Now, maybe you considered why are recessive harmful genes maintained if the person's less healthy? Wouldn't they be less likely to survive, have surviving offspring? Wouldn't that gene just eventually be slowly eliminated from our geno, you know, our gene pool that from the human genome itself? Well, it appears that some harmful genes are maintained because under some circumstances they can actually offer an advantage. Let's consider the case of sickle cell anemia, which is produced by one recessive flawed gene. Now consider the blanks below and see if you can fill them in. The last one you probably don't know, so let me give you a hint. The last blank refers to a condition born by a mosquito that kills millions of millions of people every year, not in this country, but worldwide. So take your uh, best guess at the blanks and see how you did. So let's see how you did. So to show the trait that is of sickle cell anemia, one must inherit two recessive genes, one from mom and one from dad. So if they inherit one gene, will they or will they not have the characteristic that is the sickle cell disease itself? The answer would be no. They have the gene for it but it won't be expressed. So they will not have sickle cell. And for the next uh, question, they are also forget, protected against, and there's quite a few diseases caused by mosquitoes, obviously, but the correct answer would be uh, malaria. And to give you an idea, it's very, very common in the US, uh, the global climate change, and maybe more so in the deep south. But the statistic that I was able to find the most uh, accurate one was back in 2017, not that long ago. Roughly 220 million people were infected, and at that point, about a half a million died. We do have a vaccine now, but it's only about 80 or 85 percent effective, is my understanding. If you look at the two pictures shown, one is showing a uh, vein or capillary, and you can see that the on the right, the oddly shaped red blood cells are doing a log jam. It's because of the sickling of the red blood cells, hence the name. And in the white and uh, background picture, you can also see some of the sickle cells interspersed between the normal blood cells. Being a sickle shape, they are ineffective in carrying oxygen, so the tissue is poorly oxygenated, so it can cause uh, organ damage, tissue damage in general, pain, discomfort and can lead to an event that could be fatal. So a very serious condition. I want to add, just to be clear, the reason why the individual would not have sickle cell disease if they inherit one gene for sickle cell is because from the other parent, they would have inherited the very common, very normal dominant gene for typical circular red blood cells. So they would only have the disease itself when they had no dominant gene overriding the recessive flaw. But you should know that very few human traits are controlled by a single pair of genes. Most are polygenic, meaning controlled by many, many genes. Traits that are polygenetic include height, weight, IQ, personality, mental health. You are, though, probably familiar with some traits that are controlled by a single pair of genes. Take a moment. Do you know any of these 
particular traits. Well, to answer that question, the picture on the right shows one such trait, the ability to t roll your tongue. You either can do it or you can't. Another example would be uh, freckles, uh, dimples. If your earlobe style is narrow, which is often called attached, or it dangles, often called free. If your hairline is smooth or it comes to a peak, like Count Chocula, so all those are all controlled by one pair of genes, but most of our traits are indeed polygenetic. Let's consider the basic chromosomal abnormality forms and look at, and look at a few conditions in more detail. These abnormalities include, but aren't limited to, deletions in which a portion of the chromosome is missing, duplications, in which a portion of the uh, chromosome is copied twice, uh, adding extra chromosomes. Translocations, in which part or even a whole chromosome gets moved to another chromosome. Or inversions, when part of a chromosome gets flipped. Of course, there are other ones, but we're going to focus on these. Let's consider two of the more prevalent although they're very uncommon, two of the more prevalent chromosomal deletions. First one, Wolf-Hirshhorn syndrome. It produces a very distinctive face, and the child will be intellectually disabled. The deletion is in, related to chromosome number four. Now, another example would be Creed-Schatz syndrome. How does it get its name? Or you're going to have to listen to the link to find that out, but you'll find it interesting, I think. Uh, other common features microencephaly, which means uh, small head and brain, slow growth, and intellectual disability. And again, visit the link to learn a little bit more information. It's very short, and I think you'll find it interesting. Let's consider inversions and translocations. Inversion refers to the flipping of a power chromosome. Translocation is a chromosome either in whole or part being moved and attached to a totally non-related chromosome. They both sound pretty harmless, but they're really far from it. Now, some students find it confusing between duplications and translocations, since translocations often involve an extra chromosome, and that sounds like a duplication, yes. Well, the difference is a duplication is of a chromosome getting extra copy of the same chromosome attached to itself. And a translocation that either whole or part of a chromosome gets attached to a totally different non-related, uh, biologists would call it a non-homologous chromosome. Now, these inversions or translocations sounds like they should be pretty minor, but far from it. Consider leukemia. I pictured a cute child. Uh, we, at least I think of, when I think of leukemia, I think of children. But actually, the most common uh, person experiencing leukemia would be an adult. Now, what leukemia is, if you're not familiar, it's a cancer of blood cells. Uh, the picture shows the typical outcome where there's a huge increase in the white blood cells. I should probably also mention, although your text does not indicate it, Leukemia can be caused by inversions, translocations, and since there's many forms of leukemia, there are some that are caused by duplications and others are caused by deletions. So associated with leukemia would basically uh, any one of these four chromosomal abnormalities. Let's consider one chromosomal duplication, in other words, an extra copy. Charcot-Marie Tooth Syndrome. How did it get its name? You might be looking at the picture and saying, where are the deformed teeth? The, the people uh, would not have deformed teeth. Uh, it was named after three people who co-discovered and worked on the people with the condition. Charcot, 
very famous uh, neurologist and important to abnormal psychology. Now that individual by, was by the name of Marie and the first name and the third, his name was Dr. Tooth, hence the name. The symptoms include abnormalities in the peripheral nervous system, more specifically the somatic nervous system. Now you might remember from intrapsych, soma refers to body. So this is the nervous system branch, the peripheral nervous system branch, which has the nerves that allow you to feel your body and move your body. The issues with this particular branch will cause uh, nerve issues, is particularly in legs and feet and arms and hand, uh, causing progressive weakness, deformation, as shown in these pictures, of course, pain and loss of use. Let's now consider sex chromosome abnormalities would be an extra or missing sex chromosome. So which pair of chromosomes would that be? 16, 21, 23. Hopefully you want to go with 23, so the 23rd pair. Surprisingly, many people with a sex chromosome abnormality either don't know it to puberty or often never know it. The uh, actress picture is actually very famous. I don't know if you recognize her. Her name is Linda Hunt. She's Academy Award winning. Uh, she does have a sex chromosome abnormality. She has a uh, Turner syndrome. It's thought that the father of our country might have also have had a sex chromosome issue as well as other multiple health problems. If you uh, put in any particular one of these conditions, put famous people, many names will come up. Uh, since most people have not uh, announced that they have disorder, uh, probably many or even most of them uh, do not actually have the disorder that they're listed under. But let's look at the uh, specific uh, disorders. First of all, take a look at the chromosomal pattern for the 23rd pair and decide if that person would be uh, uh, genetic slash chromosomally male or female. When you're seeing a zero, it means uh, nothing. That person only had a one sex chromosome inherited. So that's the first step, if you will, please. Let's now consider if sex chromosome abnormalities would be an extra or missing sex chromosome. So which pair of chromosomes would that be? 16, 21, 23. Hopefully you want to go with 23, so the 23rd pair. Surprisingly, many people with a sex chromosome abnormality either don't know it to puberty or often never know it. The uh, actress picture is actually very famous. I don't know if you recognize her. Her name is Linda Hunt. She's Academy Award winning. Uh, she does have a sex chromosome abnormality. She has a uh, Turner syndrome. It's thought that the father of our country might have also have had a sex chromosome issue as well as other multiple health problems. If you uh, put in any particular one of these conditions, put famous people, many names will come up. Uh, since most people have not uh, announced that they have disorder, uh, probably many or even most of them uh, do not actually have the disorder that they're listed under. But let's look at the uh, specific uh, disorders. First of all, take a look at the chromosomal pattern for the 23rd pair and decide if that person would be uh, uh, genetic slash chromosomally male or female. When you're seeing a zero, it means uh, nothing. That person only had a one sex chromosome inherited. So that's the first step, if you will, please. Let's start our discussion with sex chromosome abnormalities with individuals with an XO chromosomal pattern. 
And do you know which pair of chromosomes we're talking about? Is it the 21st, 23rd? It would be the 23rd. So this individual, she, will inherit an X from either her mother or her father, and somewhere along the way, the other chromosome doesn't make it. So she only has one sex chromosome. She has Turner syndrome. She'll be on the short side, petite, and she's often uh, will have learning disabilities. When puberty is expected, it just doesn't arrive and, and doesn't arrive and doesn't arrive. And at some point along the way, she'll probably be taken to a position and Turner syndrome will be discovered. Uh, she will probably have fertility issues. It's rather unlikely that she will be able to carry a, uh, conceive or carry a pregnancy. She probably won't know it until puberty and neither will her parents or anybody would meet her. Uh, in many cultures that don't have access to medicine, uh, this would not be diagnosed. She would just be a person who is uh, never hits puberty. Let's now consider an individual with three X chromosomes, basically the opposite problem of Turner's, too many. This person, since uh, this person has no Y chromosome, she is a she. She's also going to have fertility issues and quite likely learning disabilities, but of a different nature than the Turner syndrome person. Hers will probably be in the verbal area, whereas the Turner's person more likely have spatial issues. I should mention that it's quite, quite possible that the triple X person, triple X woman, will not get diagnosed maybe until she tries to conceive and has issues, or perhaps never. Now let's move on to an individual that has a Y-O. So they inherit the Y, and would they inherit the Y from mom or dad? Well, since the woman has only the XX pattern for the 23rd, she can only contribute an X, so the Y would have had to come from dad. O indicates, like in the XO, that nothing else is inherited. This. Uh, combination is not viable when the X is lost, too much genetic information is lost, and it cannot form a complete human being without that information. So that is a non-existent pattern. Let's now consider the XYY male, sometimes called super male. The individuals will be much taller than average, will probably have a problem with acne. IQ is often in the low end of the normal range. And this would make high school and middle school probably very difficult. Tall, lanky, bad acne, low IQ. Uh, in the past, many were thought to be sociopathic because when they did genetic analysis, you know, chromosomal analysis of people in prisons, the XYY male was over, overrepresented. They thought it was due to sociopathy, uh, to a tendency to violence. But later studies looked at why they were in prison and typically for nonviolent crimes. So the reason why they are more likely to end up in prison is with a low IQ, if they choose criminality as their career, they'll probably be less efficient at it and more likely to be caught. Rather interesting. We should mention that the XYY male, as well as the YXX male, are likely to go undiagnosed. But let's focus now on the YXX male. He has extra X's, but he has the Y, so he's clearly male. He has Klinefelter syndrome. You might wonder with the extra X, is he feminized? And slightly, yes, he'd have a more uh, rounded body profile, uh, maybe more fatty tissue, rather comparable to a Native American not male. He's likely to have fertility issues due to the extra X and also likely to have learning disabilities of the uh, same nature as the woman, the, the female with an extra X, so probably in the verbal area. So again, uh, quite likely to go undiagnosed and therefore lead a very normal life. How common are the sex chromosome abnormalities? Not that uncommon. They vary dramatically in terms of 
each particular type. Kleinfelter is the uh, XXY pattern being the most common, about 1 in 500 births. Uh, others are 1 in 2 or 3,000. Uh, no, you don't need to know those numbers. Most people with sex chromosome abnormalities are not identified until puberty, though many never realize they have a sex chromosome abnormality at all. Perhaps when you were looking at the images below, you noted that the Y is not shaped like a Y. And you perhaps wondering, why is it called a Y? Well, when the X was discovered, the discoverer chose that for to symbolize unknown. He wasn't sure if it would stay in the same as the other chromosomes. And before he tested that, he just used X for unknown. A different biologist, uh, when looking at the Y, just chose the letter that came after the X. And this was all occurring in the early 1920s when the X chromosome was first discovered. Uh, if you're curious about the names, it was Hankings and Painter. You don't need to know those names. But it, that might solve a, a question that you might have had. Let's now consider Down syndrome. Take a look at the bulleted items and consider what you know about the topic, and then we'll proceed. Well, in terms of physical traits, the individual tends to be uh, on the short side of average. Their limbs tend to be a little bit squatty, so the person wouldn't be a tall six foot model uh, like body shape. They'll tend to have a little bit of extra body fat. If you look at this child's face, and I chose him because I think he's cute as a bug in a rug, the face is flat and kind of moon-shaped. Uh, the flatness is due to extra body fat. Now, if you look at this particular child, you'll see a distinctive eyelid shape, which is not necessarily present in all Down syndrome individuals, but it's common. You also see the nose tends to be small, and often the mouth is open and or the tongue is peeking out. It's not due to a large tongue, but apparently to a smaller uh, inside mouth space. So common physical traits. Let's consider health problems. Did you come up with any? Quite a few big and bad ones. Heart defects are much more common in the Downs population. Sometimes they'll even have surgery prior to birth. In the old days, uh, Down syndrome individuals usually did not make it anywhere near 50. Nowadays, typically they'll uh, surpass 50. So heart defects common. Terrible immune systems. So in the days before antibiotics, and vaccines, including flu and COVID, they typically did not get through childhood. Another problem, uh, very common that they'll get Alzheimer's decades earlier than the general population. And these are just some of the health defects uh, that are common. Now, psychologically, you can talk about the emotional uh, nature of the typical person. They tend to be, as compared to other people in general, more cheerful, more affectionate, more happy. I actually saw a com comedian uh, last night that was talking about these individuals. He has a few in his family, apparently, and he said that they're great, they're happy all the time. Uh, so the general population is a depressed, anxious mess, and they are not typically that way at all. Of course, there are exceptions, and I did work with an exception. In terms of intellect, well, somewhere uh, in the intellectually disabled range. So if this individual does indeed have an extra 21st chromosome, how many typical, uh, in a typical body cell, cell in their nose, cell in their toes, whatever, how many chromosomes would we find? Consider that for a moment. A lot of students will say uh, 49 or 48, but no, since instead of having a pair of chromosomes for the 21st, they have a tri, they have a three, they have one extra chromosome. So if you know the typical body cell number for chromosomes is 46, the answer would be 47. 
I want to mention uh, in a different topic altogether. In Scandinavian countries, almost all Down syndrome fetuses are aborted. In the U.S., it's about two thirds. And you might wonder, looking at a child like this, why would anybody want to do that? Uh, I did have a, an acquaintance that did have a Down syndrome child. Uh, the child uh, had severe health problems, could not eat orally, had to be fed through a port in their stomach, and every so often it would pop out and they would have to hightail it as quick as they could to the surgical center in uh, eastern Massachusetts to have that port replaced. Uh, the individual, even though they were uh, pushing four, was still not uh, diaper trained, I'm sorry, not potty trained, and that probably was not going to occur. So imagine having a full-size child that you're still taking care of diapering needs and feeding needs and can never leave them alone for a moment. And then, as you age, you have to face, with your mortality, who's going to take care of the child in the excellent way you have. It's a big concern and it's a big worry. So I just wanted to share perhaps a uh, perspective that you hopefully will never have to consider. Now there's actually three different types of Down syndrome. They're all, well, two of the three anyway, are associated with an extra chromosome, uh, specifically of the 21st position. But within that, some are duplications and a small number are translocations. And there's even a variety called a mosaic in which they have cells that are, some are normal and some are downs, which is way beyond what we need to know. So just consider to be having an extra 21st chromosome in almost all the cases. So Down syndrome is typically associated with additional 21st chromosome, whether it's been relocated to the same spot or a different chromosome, we'll ignore. Its other name would be trisomy 21, again reflecting that 21st chromosome and having extra content. Risk factors for it would be not drug use as some students think, but mom's age. Consider these three ages. A 30-year-old woman has a fairly low risk of having a Down syndrome baby, about one in a thousand at age 30. Doing a little rounding here. At 40, it jumps hugely to about one in a hundred. Early to mid 50s, it again dramatically jumps to about one in 10 or one in 12. So very strongly in terms of risk tied into mom's age. Dad's age appears not to be so much. Uh, Dad's age uh, does appear to be tied into some cases of autistic spectrum disorder. So now let's consider uh, physical traits, health problems, and psychological traits. Let's consider the relatively new field of science called epigenetics. Its focus is how the environment and experience can alter genes and genetic expression uh, and vice versa. For example, I very recently read a study in which they were looking at one of aspartame, artificial sweetener consumption, and mice in terms of their anxiety levels. And mice that had higher aspartame in their diets were much more anxious. But interestingly, they looked at the offspring of fathers exposed to aspartame, and not huge amounts, well within the normal human limits, the offspring of the aspartame exposed male mice were also more anxious. And interestingly, it was not due to alterations of their genetics, but alterations of the cytoplasm within the cell, which apparently has modulatory effects on gene expression. Very interesting. You might say, well, how is that genetics influence environment? Well, the environment picked by the animal, uh, the environment interacted with by the animal, or person. Go ahead and listen to the link. Uh, you just might see a question appear on it down the road. Let's consider twin types, starting with the basic two types and how they're formed. 
if I actually had a live class uh, over this particular section, I'd be asking if anybody was a twin and definitely would have to get them to volunteer the type that they are. But if your class is not live, uh, sadly, we can't do this. So again, how are each twin type form starting with uh, sperm and eggs as you think about the answer? Let's consider twin types, starting with the basic two types and how they're formed. If I actually had a live class uh, over this particular section, I'd be asking if anybody was a twin and definitely would have to get them to volunteer the type that they are. But if your class is not live, uh, sadly, we can't do this. So again, how are each twin type form starting with uh, sperm and eggs as you think about the answer? I was like to break it apart a little bit in case I stumble and have to re-record it. So factors influencing paternal twins would be mom's age. Women 35 years of age or older have increased likelihood. Racial differences, uh, people of African descent, and I can't really say people of color because it's specifically people of African descent have the highest uh, prevalence. And the individual's genotype. It runs in some families. The people most likely to have fraternal twins in the world are the, Yoru the Yor Yoruba people, uh, shown as a Yoruba, Yoruba couple. It's a hard word to say, Yoruba couple. And they have about one in 22 births, which is definitely on the highest end. Now, identical twins, not influenced by factors, is just random chance only about four out of a thousand births. So if uh, you're an identical twin, what a special rarity. So we looked at factors influencing, but we haven't considered percent of genes shared and do they have to be the same sex? So consider identical and fraternal twins. What percentage of genes do you think they share in common and do they have to be the same sex? Ponder that for a moment before you click the listening icon. So let's start with the fraternal twins. What percent of genes do they share in common? Would well, be the same for any other set of siblings? On average, 50%. Could be more, could be less, but on average, 50%. Can they be of different sexes? Absolutely. You might not be the same sex as your sibling. How about identical twins? What percentage of genetic material do they share in common? It would be exactly 100%. Do they have to be of the same sex? Well, if they share 100, or a different way of thinking of it, about it, if they're identical, yes, they have to be the same sex. In the previous slide, we defined prenatal development as lasting from conception through delivery. Uh, in other words, the time period of gestation. I thought it might be interesting for us to look at the gestation period of a few species, that of mice, rats, dogs, cats, llamas, I mean, say, why llamas? Well, I own llamas, okay. Llamas, elephants, and whales. Hope you find it interesting. When you're done guessing, uh, click the listening icon to see if you're on target or quite a bit off target. We can define conception as when the sperm and egg cell join. You probably know that, but in the next slide, I think you'll find some interesting facts that you probably don't know. Most sperm cells are viable for one to five days and eggs for typically one day. Intercourse is most likely to cause pregnancy five days before ovulation through the day of ovulation. But don't play the odds. Over 3 million Americans do yearly and lose with an unplanned, unintended pregnancy. About half of those would end uh, in uh, an abortion process. And also don't forget that although 
fertility and pregnancy can only occur a few days each month. HIV and STI infection can occur any day of the month. So a few facts you're probably already aware of and just to refresh your mind. In America, most couples are very happy to have a boy or a girl. Their usual prayer is just that the child be healthy. In many cultures, this is not the case. Consider China before the current policies where each family was only allowed one child. If it was a girl, the family name would not be carried on. So there was a terrifically high rate of abortions in China. And even nowadays in countries in which a bride price is paid, poor families can't afford it, so might selectively terminate not the pregnancy, but will actually commit uh, infanticide uh, after the baby's born. So again, not an issue in the US, but huge issue in much of the world. Let's see how you did. We'll start with the whale and go clockwise. The whale uh, is very variable. I know you're debating between the 10 and 18 months and 18 and 22. It would be the 10 to 18 months. And if you're interested, what is the 18 monther? That would be the orca, the uh, killer whale. If you notice in the picture, the placenta is still connecting the newborn baby whale to its mother. Next would be the llama. That'd be 11 and a half months, though sometimes we'll actually go over a year. That's a newborn baby just learning how to stand up, probably hasn't even nursed yet. Next, we have a, a kitten, very similar to dogs. On average for the kitten, 63 days. Next, we'll consider the, since we're going clockwise, next consider the elephant. That would be the longest of all mammalian species. Uh, that would be the 18 to 22 months. There's a little bit of variation between the African elephant and the Indian elephant. Next, we'll see the newborn puppy. That would be, on average, 64 days. And uh, going to the mouse and rat, the mouse would be, on average, 20 days, and the rat, on average, 22 days. I only put a picture of one in there. I hope you're okay with that. So hope you found that interesting. Let's consider conception, the process in which the egg is fertilized by the sperm. I find this picture interesting. I hope you do too. The gametes, uh, egg and the sperm, contain the same amount of genetic information. And look at the size difference. The egg, or if you prefer ovum, is about 10 million times bigger than the sperm cell. Also perhaps interesting is one egg is more than enough to cause uh, fertility, result in fertility, and yet the ejaculate has between maybe on the low end of it 20 million sperm cells, on the high end as much as 10 times that or so sperm cells. If at least 50%, probably 60% of them are not healthy, there would be infertility or at least fertility issues. And the bottom picture shows you some of the uh, common types of malformed sperms, including uh, head issues on the sperm or tail issues and so on. Let's now consider the stages of gestation. The first stage, stage of the zygote, though if you're a biology person, you might want to call it the germinal stage. I like zygote better myself. Last from conception through implantation of the structure. If you want to put a time to it, we'll round to the first two weeks. Many, uh, up to 50% or possibly a little bit more, are actually lost during this time period and never implant. Next stage, stage of the embryo. Two weeks to the end of the second month. Kind of convenient if you try and learn it. Stage two from week two to end of month two. Perfect, yes. Uh, during this stage, the central nervous system and organs form. The embryo can feel pain starting at week 24, which would be at six months. 
fetus, uh, stage three, begins at month three. Another nice mnemonic we're trying to learn this through birth or delivery, natural or otherwise. Uh, growth is particularly uh, fast paced here and many of the finishing touches including to the lungs so that the infant can or I'm sorry the fetus can breathe once delivered are being completed. Immature lungs are the greatest threat to a prematurely delivered fetus. Next let's consider the topic of triagens. The study of it is teratology. That's the topic that I did my master's on in graduate school. Triagens can cause harm when the developing zygote or embryo or fetus is exposed to them. Some are easily avoidable, others not at all. So let's look at some examples. Alcohol and other drugs. Often students will want to say caffeine or nicotine. Well, remember, caffeine and nicotine are other drugs. Now, these other drugs can be street drugs, uh, commonly used drugs such as tobacco, which is not a street drug, and some can actually include prescription drugs. Bacteria and foods. Can you think of any foods that pregnant women should avoid based on bacteria that could be in them? Well, apparently unpasteurized honey, uh, heavily processed foods like salami, uh, women should definitely not do rare hamburger, for example, or if you thought sushi, you are correct. Uh, X-rays. Women are typically asked in, say, a dental office, could they possibly be pregnant? X-rays are a tragedy. Consider some diseases that can be passed from mother to child, either prenatally or in the birthing process. What can you come up with? Go ahead, think of it. You might say HIV, and you are correct. I would like to mention that in this part of this country, it's really a, almost of no excuse that a baby is born HIV positive if the mother was pregnant in this country. Of HIV testing is free, and if the mother does have HIV, she can be provided free of cost drugs that will virtually eliminate the possibility that her child would be born HIV positive. So HIV is certainly a good answer. Uh, what about the disease that is uh, shown in this picture? That would be the Zika virus. Uh, measles. Women who have not had their measles shot, if they become pregnant, risk having their child exposed to measles prenatally, and that can be devastating. Blindness, deafness, uh, intellectual disability can result. So many diseases are teratogens. What about metals, and how would the woman get exposed to the metals? You might be saying mercury. Well, how would a woman get exposed to mercury? There's no mercury in thermometers anymore. Ah, uh, for example, certain fish that are heavy in fats, uh, fish from the Great Lakes, for example, I would not go near. Uh, fish like swordfish uh, are also uh, ocean fish that are at risk of having too much mercury. And this, of course, was just a partial list. On this slide, we'll consider FAS, FAE, and FASD. Starting with FAS, you might be screaming, I know this one, it's fetal alcohol syndrome. Well, yes and no. This term is actively being replaced. So although yes, it used to always refer to fetal alcohol syndrome, now it's really part of fetal alcohol spectrum, as in uh, the last term, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So that would be a, a better answer. FAE refers to a, the lightest end of FASD. FAE refers to fetal alcohol effects. So again, FAS in current lingo, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum, FAE, fetal alcohol effects, FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Now in terms of key features of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, a person on the, uh, the full end of the continuum with a very strong case of it would be born smaller and stay somewhat smaller. Uh, they would always have various physical issues, uh, basically malformations. 
depending on what structures were being affected most when the mother was drinking. For one person, it might be the kidneys. For another one, it might be their spinal cord. Another one, it might be their inner ear and so on. So the individual will always have malformations to deal with. The person will also have with full fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, intellectual disability permanently. And even children on the middle range of it will have altered facial features such as these four individuals shown, these four children, uh, though the children with the lightest uh, diagnosis, FAE, would not have any of these features we've discussed so far. So if we continue and we look at these children's faces, what jumps out at you is not being quite right. You might see the increased space between the eyes. You might notice that sparkle that most children's eyes have of intelligence and curiosity. It doesn't seem to be jumping out at us. You might see their noses are all smaller. The upper lips are all thinner, giving that space between the upper lip and the nose a much larger appearance because it is because of changes of shape of nose and upper lip. So not terrible changes by any stretch of the imaginations, but telling. It does tell us uh, the child was alcohol exposed. Again, this, these children with these facial features do have full FASD. Let's consider the term that might be new to you totally, uh, FAE, fetal alcohol effects. Uh, these effects are associated with moms who drank lightly socially during some part of their pregnancy. Fetal alcohol effects would not infect, affect intellect or cause malformations, but fetal alcohol effects would cause such features as hyperactivity and or learning disabilities. And don't we have a lot of children that have these features? Clearly, some of them, not all of them by any stretch of the imagination, but some children with FAE uh, showing the hyperactivity and uh, learning, dis learning disability feature it was clearly alcohol induced. The next slide will discuss a way that is foolproof in terms of avoiding uh, any sort of condition related to FASD. There is an existing body of knowledge of the effects of marijuana as teratogens, but this research often is of much poorer quality, and certainly we can't give uh, marijuana in a study with an experimental control group and see what happens to the children in the uh, experimental group that would be obviously highly unethical. So these studies are correlational in nature, but with a recent uh, number of states that are legalizing marijuana for recreational use, we'll see much uh, more numerous studies and probably much higher quality of studies. But one document, documented outcome is a significantly higher rate of learning disabilities in these children. Let's now consider the effects of tobacco on the child. I'm not going to distinguish prenatal from postnatal development. And I say tobacco, not nicotine, because until now, people rarely expose themselves to just nicotine. With vaping, that's new, and we'll probably see much more research that is uh, nicotine specific. But in the past, the woman would have been exposed to smoking, for example, which would not include just nicotine, but literally thousands of other highly dangerous chemicals. I hope you find this picture disturbing. Uh, I did. Can you take a moment and think of as many effects that you're aware of of tobacco on children? When you've done this, you can switch to the next slide and see how many of them that you were actually able to uh, propose. We know that children that have been exposed to, to tobacco have a significantly higher rate of SIDS this does not mean that every SIDS baby was exposed to uh, tobacco, and certainly not every tobacco-exposed baby uh, will experience SIDS. Do you know what the letters SIDS stand for? If you're thinking sudden infant death syndrome, you are correct. Uh, lung issues, definitely. 20% uh, of American children have asthma. Tobacco exposure is a major cause. Ear infections are much more common in children that are regularly exposed to tobacco smoke. Cancers. Certain cancers are much more prevalent in the children of smokers. What a terrible thing to do to one's child. 
lower birth weight. On average, tobacco exposed children weigh a half pound less. Now a half pound to your eye is nothing, but if you only weigh five or six or seven or eight pounds, a half a pound is a very big deal. Babies with lower birth weight have a significantly lower rate of survival. Also potentially lowered IQ, some correlational studies suggest that on average the children of smokers have seven IQ points lower. And seven IQ points is a big deal. If I give you seven extra IQ points, take it and run, it would make your college life easier. If I tried to steal some of your IQ points, don't let me, that would make your college life considerably harder. These are just some of the effects of tobacco on children. All these children were exposed to thalidomide prenatally. And as soon as the babies began to be born, uh, the shocking and clearly and quickly linked to thalidomide. Uh, these children are sometimes called flipper babies because the arm is often fl a flipper-like appendage. Uh, back in high school, my best friend's cousin was a thalidomide baby. Her, lengths, her arms were about roughly normal length, a little bit shorter, uh, same with her legs, but they were fused with limited mobility at slightly odd angles, and her toes and fingers were also uh, fused as well. At that point, uh, even though she was a young woman, she had over 20 surgeries trying to give her greater mobility and use of her arms and legs. Let me tell you a little bit of the history of this drug. This drug was first uh, created in Germany. The company called it a wonder drug and claimed it cured everything from acne to impotence. One thing it did, though, was help to deal with nausea and who's nauseous but pregnant women. So the FDA was doing a very limited trial of about 20,000 individuals. And the sad thing about this in particular was it was never adequately tested on animals. If it had been given the typical animal testing before moving to the human trials, this entire tragedy could have been prevented. No one likes animal testing. I certainly don't. But given the choice of giving it a drug to pregnant women or pregnant rats, I'll take pregnant rats 10 times out of 10, and I suspect you might too. We noted that prescription drugs can also be teratogens. Have you ever heard of the drug thalidomide? And are you aware of what specific effect it had on the children exposed to it? Take a moment and think about that. If you notice the PowerPoint had an E on it, and the picture of the drug did not, and we're wondering, uh, let me explain it. Every drug has three names. It has the brand name, the generic name, and the highly chemical name. So for example, if you like uh, Excedrin, it's the same thing as acetaminophen, but Excedrin would be the brand name. Let's consider another drug that can cause uh, teratogenic effects. The anti-acne drug isotretinoin, if I'm saying that correctly. Even short-term exposure, uh, babies will be born with either small ears, sometimes no ears, and or eye defects, or believe it or not, even more severe defects than that. It can also uh, occur if the mother is uh, using the product while she's nursing. Imagine how easy it would be to maybe uh, give the anti-acne drug to a friend because it's not working for you without giving them that warning, or perhaps a woman's using and her birth control method fails. Uh, common reasons why maybe a hormonal birth control method might be full, uh, might fail would be use of antibiotics with it. Many people don't know that. Or use of the antidepressant over-the-counter St. John's wort. So even, again, short exposure to this drug during pregnancy or nursing can have profound effects. You may or may not be familiar with RH incompatibility, but I'd be willing to bet that you've watched medical shows in which they call for blood for transfusion, being B positive or B negative. Well, this is rather what they're talking about. So some people have a particular protein, the RH protein, they're positive, like an MB positive. Other people lack this blood protein, they have the negative, like an B negative. RH stands for rhesus because it was first detected in the rhesus monkey 
of blood cells and later also found in humans. Now, when it comes to human pregnancy or rhesus pregnancy for that matter, the problem happens when mom lacks the antibody, the protein rather, she lacks the protein uh, shown for the negative on the picture and the baby inherited the positive from the father. So the first pregnancy, this is fine, will cause no issues, but there's a certain degree of blood mixing during the birthing process. Some uh, mom will start to create antibodies for the Rh positive blood type. So if she carries another baby that's Rh positive, her immune system will set out to destroy the baby's blood. And obviously this can be lethal or highly damaging. In the late 60s, a simple immunization became available that prevents this process from happening. It's still problematic in some area of the world where they don't have access to this uh, modern medicine and the effects can be devastating. But a brief history of the Rh incompatibility issue. Next, let's consider prenatal diagnostic methods. Some are done in almost every pregnancy in the US versus others are very uncommon and done only with specific reasons in mind. Let's consider maternal blood testing. Almost universally done in this country. Why not? It's just a blood test, non-invasive. I will admit I'm a wuss on blood tests. But anyway, uh, it screens for a variety of conditions, including Down syndrome, uh, neural tube defects. Uh, the neural tube of, forms, forms the brain and the spinal cord. So uh, the picture shows three possible neural tube conditions. Now you aren't responsible for those three names and what goes with them. But anyway, it can also screen for genetic conditions that may be, be of concern given family history, maybe of a family uh, history of sickle cell or PKU or Tay-Sachs or any number of conditions that they might be able to screen uh, given what's uh, the cells that leak into mom's blood supply. I should caution against uh, false positives and false negatives. Consider those terms and see if you know or maybe you can guess what they are. Well, a false positive is an indication that there may be a problem when there's really not. Obviously, it would very much scare the parents. A false negative is when there is a condition of concern and the test says they're not. I've had so many students over the past who have had false positives uh, leading to more invasive procedures such as amniocentesis or CVS. And in every single case, it was initially the case of a false positive, but still uh, of concern, obviously even though relief once it is a, a false positive. So let's consider amniocentesis. You probably are familiar with the term amniotic sac. Well, in this procedure, a rather long needle is inserted and they use a topical anesthetic, but that's all it can do. So a rather long needle is inserted through the abdomen, and then through the uterine wall, through the amniotic sac, uh, and they're doing an ultrasound while doing this so they don't actually deadly, uh, nick the baby. A small amount of fluid, oh, okay, a moderate amount of fluid is drawn out and analyzed. The fluid has the cells of the baby, so it's a way of getting the cells of the baby without actually interacting or damaging the fetus. This is not typically done unless there's a pressing reason. Maybe there's a suspicion of Down syndrome. There's other conditions that need to be screened for that are unusual. It can't be done until uh, month four so if the couple or the mother would abort, or the pregnant woman, the pregnant person, we really should say, uh, if the pregnant person uh, would abort, it's got to be done early enough, so this would be an option. Let's consider maternal blood testing. Non-invasive, just a blood test typically done in first and second trimesters. Screens for many, many things, including neural tube defects, that means of the brain and spinal cord, also Down syndrome, genetic conditions that might be a concern for 
because of a particular family's history, the cells uh, actually will be in the blood supply to a small level uh, if the fetus does have it, uh, sickle cell, Tay-Sachs, PKU, and many other conditions. There is a concern about particularly false positives, and I've had this happen to students who have shared the experience where it's indicated that there's a problem, and then that requires more invasive testing like a amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling, and then happily, uh, thankfully, uh, the results are negative. The, the fetus is not carrying those particular genes, but the false positive rate can be very problematic and very scary. An alternative to amniocentesis is chorionic villus sampling. You might not be familiar with this one, in part because most people have heard about an amniotic sac or amniotic fluid, versus most people probably have not heard about the chorion. The idea behind it's the same. There's going to be a needle used that's going to pull out tissue, uh, again, not directly of the baby, but in this example of the chorion, which is a tissue uh, related to the placenta that has the same uh, genetics as the baby. So we're getting baby without damaging baby. Uh, the advantage of the chorion of sampling is it can be done much earlier than an amniocentesis, as early as two and a half months. And you might remember that the amniocentesis uh, can't be done until four. The uh, disadvantage of both the uh, chorionic villa sampling, or CVS, and uh, amniocentesis is that there's a small risk of miscarriage, about 1%. So your odds are very good. But if a doctor does 100 of these procedures, a baby will be lost. So it's still worth considering. Again, only done when there's a particularly strong need to assess the genetics of the uh, fetus. Let's check your chart reading ability. Examine the chart below, which looks at maternal age and the rate of complications. You can see the different colors are used to uh, represent different ages of moms. And draw a conclusion or two, uh, the most maybe obvious conclusion or two. And click the next icon to see if your conclusions match mine. So we see if we look at the green bar, there's starting to be a significant change between uh, mom's age and negative outcomes in three different areas, maternal preeclampsia, low birth weight, and actual fetal death. So at the green level, which is 40 to 49, you're seeing an increase. But we see a huge increase at age 50 to 55 in these three measures. So we can say that there is a positive correlation between complications and age of mom. As mom's age goes up, so does the complication rate. If mom's age goes down, the complication rate goes down. Let's look at a few of the common miscarriage causes. And there's quite a long list, and this is only a partial list. First, we see gestational diabetes. Many women, for the first time in their lives, experience diabetes while pregnant. Typically, after the pregnancy ends, her diabetic, her blood sugar levels go back to normal. This does let her know that she's at risk of future diabetes, so it's particularly important for her to keep her weight in check. Uh, gestational diabetes can affect the baby, uh, can result in miscarriage, or babies that are born very high birth weight, making it difficult for the mom and for them to be delivered. There's also preeclampsia, or outer right, right eclampsia, or toxemia. This occurs when there's too much something in the urine causing severe swelling, uh, technically edema. And that suggests there are problems in one particular structure. Think for a moment and see if you know what might go in the blanks. Too much. Now you might be tempted to say sugar based on the previous question, but no. It'd be too much protein in the urine, which would cause severe swelling, in other words, edema, denoting kidney problems. This can be a toxic condition, so either it can cause this a little bit of swelling in the foot and leg, 
or it can be life-threatening to both the baby and the mom. Sometimes if it's severe enough, if it's full-blown toxemia, there might need to be an emergency C-section. Infections can also be a cause of miscarriage. Consider oral infections, uh, gum issues. We now know that having bad gums, uh, periodontal disease is a risk factor from everything from heart disease through miscarriage. So oral hygiene and health is very important. Uh, also STIs, uh, both bacterial uh, or viral. Hormonal issues, particularly the pregnancy related hormones uh, prolactin uh, and more so though progesterone and estrogen. So if estrogen levels are too low and progesterone levels are too low, miscarriage is likely. Nowadays there's many uh, hormonal medications which would help with this issue very very significantly. Also certain genetic conditions or chromosomal issues can cause the early loss of a fetus. And it's probably a little comfort to the parent but Many of these babies that are lost in early miscarriage have profound issues and would have never survived if gone full term and would have a dramatically uh, devastating uh, health history. Again, probably a little comfort to the grieving parents. As you know, some teratogens are of a viral or bacterial nature. This slide will consider some, but we'll still focus on a couple of other ones separately since they're important enough to uh, get additional uh, discussion. Viral tragedies include rubella. Hopefully, no matter what your sex or gender or your intention to have children or not, hopefully you're up on your MMR. But for a person that could become pregnant, this is particularly important. Uh, having rubella during pregnancy can result in a child that's hearing impaired or visual impaired or fully without vision or hearing, uh, heart defects, brain damage, a, a ton of issues and so easily presented by, prevented by uh, immunization. Not much trouble in this country, but if you travel or you get exposed to somebody from another country who is not immunized and you are not immunized, it could be a big bad problem. So, so easy to prevent. Also hepatitis of the B variety. If mom does have hepatitis, when the uh, baby is delivered afterwards, they'll start a regime of shots to prevent them become uh, hepatitis B positive. Uh, CMV we're going to consider on a separate slide. Uh, other uh, viral teratogens are STI, such as herpes. If mom has an herp active herpes infection, that can cause brain damage, uh, vision loss, and other terrible things. So if mom is uh, active in infection with herpes, a C-section will be typically done. Uh, HIV, in this country, not much of an issue because if mom is HIV positive, she will take medications and those medications will fully prevent that child from being born with HIV. Obviously, in countries that don't have this medical advantage, this is a huge issue. Uh, bacterial infections include uh, STIs. Now, mom can be treated during the pregnancy, so that's very good news, and she'll be screened uh, during the, as part of the pregnancy process. I would mention that uh, the specific antibiotic uh, tetracycline uh, can cause teeth staining, and not all doctors are up on this, and from personal experience, uh, but of course I'm much older than probably most of you, uh, tetracycline, if given to a pregnant mom, can cause staining of that child's teeth later on. They don't even have teeth formed yet, but it can cause long-term teeth staining. So make that a consideration if you are a pregnant person and you do need an antibiotic. Ask about that particular risk, because eh, why do that to the child, at least knowingly. Do you recognize the condition that this uh, poor young lad has? It came to world attention in 2016. Uh, his mother was exposed to the Zika virus, causing profound uh, changes in the skull and brain, leading to uh, massive intellectual uh, issues, profound uh, intellectual disability. Not much of a problem in the US for Americans unless they were traveling. 
It's a limited issue in this country, but a serious problem in Central and South America. Let's consider a parasitic teratogen, that of toxoplasmosis. If you're at all familiar with it, you probably associate it with cats, and that's a good association. Uh, cats that are outside that hunt will pick up the parasite, which can be transferred to a person. And having uh, toxoplasmosis in adults is usually undamaging and unnoticed, but they can uh, pass it to a newborn. Uh, in terms of pregnant people, if that pregnant person does have toxoplasmosis, half the babies will be preterm, and preterm is such a huge health risk. Uh, in terms of how the pregnant person or how anybody can get toxoplasmosis, okay, so cats are a risk, particularly kittens, they have a much higher load, so if you go to a friend's house and they have an adorable kitten, restrain the urge to pick it up or pet it. And if you do wash your hands like really, really well, like over 30 seconds, over 30 seconds, it can be from undercooked meat. Uh, one way that you can take the meat out of the equation is if you freeze the meat for a couple days, it does get rid of this particular parasite. Not all parasites, but this particular parasite. So that's an easy way to protect. It can also be from unwashed or improperly washed fruits and vegetables and gardening. So wear gloves if you garden and uh, wash your hands after gardening. So there's a few simple things you can do that greatly uh, decrease that uh, that baby's risk. Uh, most babies that are exposed are fine, but some do have abnormally small or big heads with uh, intellectual disability, cerebral palsy. So the problems can be very small. There's a huge list of small problems or huge problems like the ones I just mentioned. And this one particularly shocked me. Uh, an individual who was born with it, uh, no symptoms, not detected, can still get problems 20 or 30 years later, including uh, pneumonias, seizures, eye or vision problems. That kind of blew me away. So do ask your doctor if you're a pregnant person or a partner or a pregnant person about toxoplasmosis testing. You recognize the condition that this uh, poor young lad has. It came to world attention in 2016. Uh, his mother was exposed to the Zika virus, causing profound uh, changes in the skull and brain, leading to uh, massive intellectual uh, issues, a profound uh, intellectual disability. Not much of a problem in the U.S. for Americans unless they were traveling. So limited issue in this country, but a serious problem in Central and South America. Let's consider a parasitic teratogen, that of toxoplasmosis. If you're at all familiar with it, you probably associate it with cats, and that's a good association. Uh, cats that are outside that hunt will pick up the parasite, which can be transferred to a person. And having uh, toxoplasmosis in adults is usually undamaging and unnoticed, but they can uh, pass it to a newborn. Uh, in terms of pregnant people, if that pregnant person does have toxoplasmosis, half the babies will be preterm, and preterm is such a huge health risk. Uh, in terms of how the pregnant person or how anybody can get toxoplasmosis. Okay, so cats are a risk, particularly kittens. They have a much higher load. So if you go to a friend's house and they have an adorable kitten, restrain the urge to pick it up or pet it. And if you do wash your hands like really, really well, like over 30 seconds, over 30 seconds, it can be from undercooked meat. Uh, one way that you can take the meat out of the equation is if you freeze the meat for a couple days, it does get rid of this particular parasite, not all parasites, but this particular parasite. So that's an easy way to protect. It can also be from unwashed or improperly washed fruits and vegetables and gardening. So wear gloves if you garden and uh, wash your hands after gardening. So there's a few simple things you can do that greatly uh, decrease that, uh, that baby's risk. Uh, most babies that are exposed are fine, but 
some do have abnormally small or big heads with uh, intellectual disabilities, cerebral palsy. So the problems can be very small. There's a huge list of small problems or huge problems like the ones I just mentioned. And this one particularly shocked me. Uh, an individual who was born with it, uh, no symptoms, not detected, can still get problems 20 or 30 years later, including uh, pneumonias, seizures, eye or vision problems. That kind of blew me away. So do ask your doctor if you're a pregnant person or a partner or a pregnant person about costoplasmosis testing. I thought that CMB virus deserved its own slide. CMB stands for cytomegalovirus, which you do not need to know what it stands for. It's relatively common. More than half of adults have it with no symptoms. So it's very common. It can be spread by close contact, uh, including food sharing. In some daycare centers, it's 100% of the children that have been exposed because it transmits easily by caretakers or from child-to-child -child -child contact. In some countries, virtually 100% of children will get exposed to it. The babies that are exposed prenatally, half of them will be preterm or low birth weight. We know how serious that is, or we will in this chapter. If the child develops it after birth, uh, symptoms will include a rash, hearing or vision symptoms, or yellowing of the skin due to uh, liver issues. And there's many more symptoms, but those are some of the big ones. So rash, uh, hearing or sight, or yellowing. It's considered to be a major cause of, in uh, children, it's a major cause of the congenital, that means born with, it's a major cause of congenital vision issues, hearing issues, and in general, severe nervous system issues. So although it's usually uh, not an issue at all, it has the potential to be quite serious. I thought that CMB virus deserved its own slide. CMB stands for cytomegalovirus, which you do not need to know what it stands for. It's relatively common. More than half of adults have it with no symptoms. So it's very common. It can be spread by close contact, uh, including food sharing. In some daycare centers, it's 100% of the children that have been exposed because it transmits easily by caretakers or from child-to-child -child -child contact. In some countries, virtually 100% of children will get exposed to it. The babies that are exposed prenatally, half of them will be preterm or low birth weight. We know how serious that is, or we will in this chapter. If the child develops it after birth, uh, symptoms will include a rash, hearing or vision symptoms, or yellowing of the skin due to uh, liver issues. And there's many more symptoms, but those are some of the big ones. So rash, uh, hearing or sight, or yellowing. It's considered to be a major cause of, in uh, children, it's a major cause of the congenital, that means born with, it's a major cause of congenital vision issues, hearing issues, and in general, severe nervous system issues. So although it's usually uh, not an issue at all, it has the potential to be quite serious. Let's consider the age of viability. This is the age that the baby can survive outside the womb. Do you know which particular organ is most involved in this survival or lack thereof? Maybe you're thinking brain or heart, but actually it would be the lungs. There's a dramatic difference in viability between week 23 and 24. At week 23, infants that survive which would only be about 50%, uh, most will have severe neurological issues such as severe cerebral palsy. At week 24, 70% survive and very few with cerebral palsy or other conditions. So dramatic difference based on age.
many if not most hospitals will not attempt to save a fetus before week 23 because of the devastating outcome if the uh, the premature baby did live cerebral palsy is a family of neurological disorders caused by brain damage most most typically associated with the birthing process the key feature is the issues of movement the issue just might hit the individual might have just some issues uh, maybe needing a uh, leg brace they may uh, need a full wheelchair and uh, obviously other assistance the other issues that are comorbid with it and in other words co-occurring are very variable the individual may have intellectual disability or I did have a student with cerebral palsy who did it obviously fine they can have trouble swallowing which can make it very difficult they might need a port for their stomach if it's severe enough uh, it can also involve sensory systems such as visual impairment to full blindness uh, hearing impairment to full deafness and epilepsy is not particularly uncommon in this group of individuals For most women, a weight gain during pregnancy of 25 to 30 pounds is considered to be uh, normal and desirable, but it must be nutritious foods. For example, if her diet, uh, or we might say the pregnant person's diet, is low in folic acid, deficiency of one particular vitamin can cause central nervous system defects, that is, of the brain and spinal cord. Do you know which vitamin? It would be B vitamin. Let's consider what this weight gain is comprised of next. So what is comprising this weight gain? Well, the most obvious would be the baby, the uh, developing fetus, typically somewhere between six and eight pounds, so certainly more or less. An equal amount, give or take, would be additional fat and protein on the mother's body. The next uh, uh, leading part of the weight gain would be surprisingly blood if you're curious uh, you don't need to know it about four pounds though uh, other body fluids and if you're curious you don't need to know the number three pounds that would be lymphatic uh, fluids and such and the breasts in terms of increase of mammary tissue about two pounds so you don't know, need to know the individual uh, weight gains other than say the baby but it might be helpful to know what the weight gains comprised of Let's see how you do on this review activity. So first one, male. So we know he's got to have a Y. And fertility issues, feminization and learning disabilities. Ah, that would mean an extra X. So that would be, uh, in addition to the typical XY, he would be an X, XY or a Y, XX, either way. For the female, so we know that she's got an X with no O's. Puberty but fertility problems. Ah, she has an extra X, so XXX. Next one, this individual is tall, acne, slightly lower IQ. In the past, we're thought to be sociopathic incorrectly. So it would have to have an X and a Y, because this would be a male we're talking about, if you remember. And uh, it'd be an extra Y, so XYY. Or you could flip it the other way around if you wanted. Uh, non-existent that would be the Y-O uh, this person is short uh, no puberty fertility problems uh, this would be the XO female now uh, in terms of names the uh, super male would be the uh, XYY the Turner syndrome person would be a female of XO Klein Pelters would be the male with the XXY and triple X would be the female uh, XXX. So there you go. Let's see how you do on this review activity. So first one, male. So we know he's got to have a Y. And fertility issues, 
feminization and learning disabilities, ah, that would mean an extra X. So that would be, uh, in addition to the typical XY, he would be an X, XY or a Y XX, either way. For the female, so we know that she's got an X with no O's, puberty but fertility problems, ah, she has an extra X, so XXX. Next one is individuals tall, acne, slightly lower IQ. In the past, we thought to be sociopathic incorrectly. So it would have to have an X and a Y, because this would be a male we're talking about, if you remember. And uh, it'd be an extra Y, so XYY. Or you could flip it the other way around if you wanted. Uh, non-existent, that would be the YO. Uh, this person is short, uh, no puberty, fertility problems. Uh, this would be the XO female. Now, uh, in terms of names, the uh, super male would be the uh, XYY. The Turner syndrome person would be a female of XO. Klein Pelters would be the male with the XXY, and triple X would be the female. Uh, X, X, X. So there you go. This activity is similar to the other one, but goes at the same content at a different angle. So first one, male. So we know there's got to be a Y there. Fertility issues, feminization. Ah, that would be the extra X. So that would be Klinefelter syndrome. Female, so we don't want a Y there. So female has puberty, but fertility issues and learning disabilities. So since she does have puberty, she would definitely not be the XO. She would be the triple X, or sometimes called trisomy X. Next individual, a tall, acne, low IQ. In the past, they're thought to be sociopathic, which they were not. Uh, this person, uh, would be a male if that's a help. So that would be the quote unquote super male. Next one, where the individual has uh, just a Y chromosome with no uh, corresponding X, not possible, not viable, too much genetic information would be lost to make a person. So the not possible choice. And the last one, uh, short, uh, female, no puberty, uh, that's the key from the other one, no puberty, fertility issues, and learning disabilities of, in this case, a spatial, that would be a female with just one X, so that would be the XO, so that would be Turner syndrome. So go ahead and try this activity and then check your answers. So first blank, three stages of what? Gestation, delivery, fetal development. We'll go with fetal development. Stage one, uh, stage of the, you can go with blastocyte or you can go with zygote. And it's, is it the entire first month or the first two weeks? It's the first two weeks. Stage two, stage of the embryo. And how convenient for people trying to learn this, stage two, well, it begins at the end of week two to the end of month two. So that we have our twos. Stage three, very conveniently, if you're learning it, is from the third month to the birth and its term, well, stage of the fetus. Let's consider two of the more prevalent, although they're very uncommon, two of the more prevalent chromosomal deletions. First one, Wolf-Hirshhorn syndrome. It produces a very distinctive face, and the child will be intellectually disabled. The deletion is in, related to chromosome number four. Now another example would be cri de Chat syndrome. How does it get its name? Or well, you're gonna have to listen to the link to find that out, but you'll find it interesting, I think. Uh, other common features, microencephaly, which means uh, small head and brain, 
slow growth, and intellectual disability. And again, visit the link to learn a little bit more information. It's very short, and I think you'll find it interesting. After you've studied the basic chromosomal abnormalities, see if you can match the definition to the type of abnormality, and then, without peeking, see for each of these conditions noted if you know what type of chromosomal issue uh, abnormality they stem from. Now, as you probably remember, leukemia is a family of cancers of the blood. The most likely person to get it would be a white male who is ages 70 or older, by the way. Now, my answer here will be different from your text, and I'll explain why and why my answer is better. There are eight forms of leukemia, four very common within leukemia, and four very rare. We're going to consider all eight forms in the answer versus your text just concentrates on the most common forms. So, yes, it can be due to an inversion or a uh, deletion, but it could also be due to a duplication or a translocation. Huntington's, more properly called Huntington's chorea, is a highly unusual condition in that it's caused by a dominant gene. So there are no uh, carriers if you have the gene. If you live long enough, you will experience Huntington's. Now, as you probably remember, colorblindness is carried on the X of the sex chromosomes. But are the sex chromosomes pair 21 or pair 23? Hopefully you're leaning towards pair 23. So an individual with an XY combination, a, a chromosomal male, if he inherits that gene for colorblindness on his X, he will be colorblind. Now for the female, in order for her to have colorblind, she's got to have no normal gene for normal color vision. So she's got to inherit an X from mom for that has the gene for colorblindness and an X from dad for that also recessive gene for being colorblind. So unless they're genetically related or maybe met at a convention for colorblind people, that's not likely to happen. So Far, far, far few, uh, fewer women are colorblind than men. Now, sickle cell is not an issue of the sex chromosomes. I, not that it's important for you to know, but it's a gene residing on the uh, number 11 pair of chromosomes. So. Actually, having sickle cell anemia means that each chromosome 11 had that recessive gene for sickle cell anemia. Not having sickle cell disease, but being a carrier, means the person has one uh, healthy chromosome 11 and one carrying the recessive gene for sickle cell. And the last one, the pre uh, that would be a chromosomal deletion syndrome. And you might have to practice these a few times, but I think you can learn it if you do, so go for it.